I'd like to take this time to introduce to you who will again come in and out of the balance of today's event, who has come here from Delray, Florida, who has a TV program that many of you watch daily, uh, Monday through Friday on Trento Vision. And he is the executive director and founder of what is a very powerful program that conveys a message about what needs to be done in our history and our culture and also our awareness of what is happening in our country in regard to Sharia law, in regard to jihad, and the almost foremost authority on terrorism. I'd like to introduce who is now a very dear friend who has participated long distance across the state, if you will, in helping getting this launched and has been following this event um, over the last couple of years. And I'd like to introduce you to my friend and yours, Tom Trento. American Airlines Flight 11, Boston to Los Angeles, 81 passengers. United Airlines 175, Boston to Los Angeles, 56 passengers. American Airlines 77, Washington DC to Los Angeles, 58 passengers. United Airlines Flight 93, Newark to San Francisco, 37 passengers, 251 passengers plus four crews 12 years ago, right now, entered a moment in history unaware to them that morning, unaware to their families, unaware to their friends, unaware to the world that indeed that moment on that hallowed day 12 years ago the world and this country as we know it would change do not do not leave this Patriots Park without walking to that monument, putting your hand on that monument, and recognizing individuals motivated by that event and the death of 251 passengers and nearly 3,000 innocent Americans. Do not leave this park without touching that black granite and asking yourself the question, what does it take for a man or a woman to volunteer by their own volition to step forward and engage in an activity that may indeed result in your name being engraved in granite. Good morning, Tom Trento here to say hello to everybody. How are you all doing today? What's going on? We got the North over here. You alive, North? Can we hear you a little bit? We got the North over here and the South over here. Say hello, South. Is this a beautiful day or what? It's a solemn day without question. It's a hallowed day without question. And we're here to recognize those elements. But I would be remiss, standing in front of flags at half-mast, I would be remiss if I didn't also challenge everybody here to recognize that this is a day of anger, of indignation. 
This is a day of righteous anger, righteous indignation. What took place and what is taking place is no small feat, no small activity. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in the definitive battle on the, uh, in, in the epic of mankind ever. We are in a battle that has the capability to bring about no hyperbole here to bring about the end of the world as we know it now. And there is a determined enemy unknown by this administration and sadly the administration before unknown in its essence. Terrorism. That's not the definition of what we're fighting. Extremism. Not the definition of what we're fighting. I don't know about you but those of you who have served here know it's difficult to defeat an enemy you cannot name. We are in a battle where more names will be engraved on more granite in this country and the, the prospect of, of winning going forward, as I see it and many others that do the work I do, is slim to none in terms of defeating this enemy. You see, this enemy, which is Islam, I'm not qualifying radical Islam or Sharia Islam. The enemy is Islam. It's not our job to tell Islamic scholars that they're wrong in their belief about Dar al-Hijra, Dar al-Islam. One of the doctrines of Islam is Islam, Islam, not radical Islam or moderate Islam. Islam, one of the doctrines, one of the defining elements of that system, and Islam is primarily a governmental uh, political system with a religious veneer. It is dedicated, when you, when you apostatize as a Muslim out of Islam, you become an enemy of the state, a traitor, because Islam is a state supremacist totalitarian system. What I'm saying right here is unknown, unknown to John Brennan, the head of the CIA, unknown to him. It's unknown to Valerie Jarrett, chief advisor, and Susan Rice, to this president on national security. Islam, by its doctrine, by its scholars, is in a constant state of war. Uh, Dar al-Harb, constant state of war against the West, the infidel, the Jews, the Christians. Until we understand and have a war footing that is constant, the enemy, the enemy will prevail. Maybe not kinetically, but there's a cultural Islamic jihad going on in this world, equally, if not more deadly and dangerous to Western civilization. And you will see it today manifested in Kumbaya interfaith meetings where the Islamic subtle infiltration, IO, influence operation modalities are taking place. I know I'm hitting you with a lot of stuff today, but we would be remiss for those names engraved on that granite and for whom those flags are flown at half mass if we did not honestly speak out about the war that we're in the middle of, folks. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Time I have here. Check the clock. Okay, a couple of points and then uh, we will uh, move on. It is critical as as, uh, as humans, I happen to be a Christian, it is critical as a Christian to make a distinction between the system of Islam and a human being who is a Muslim. I am commanded and I desire to love all people. I do not hate, though I'm listed by the United States military as a hate organization. I'm listed by the, uh, our group here and some of our guys are right here. The Southern Poverty Law Center as a hate organization. But we, we only hate individuals that hate that flag and want to destroy the Constitution. It's the only people we hate. 
They could be any religion. They fall into that. They're, they're my enemy, everyone here, ideological enemy. And if it, if it uh, escalates to the kinetic component, as it has, as it does, then uh, we're doing everything we can to keep that from happening here. There is a love and concern, and if you watch our show and the United West Counterterrorism Organization, we're always talking about uh, assisting and helping Muslims who want to leave the, 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 the death cult in many respects of, uh, of Islamic Jihad and come over to the United States, assimilate, be part of this country like out my parents and grandparents did coming over from Italy. Any Italian people? Any Italian people there? All right. Macaroni at 12 o'clock, all right? Um, and, and we're here. We've done that. We've worked with Muslims who have left Islam and converted or not converted out and uh, I, I have a public uh, standing offer. Any Muslim, anywhere that needs help, it's very difficult to get out of that system. We're here to help them. So we don't hate Muslims. We hate an ideology that is committed by doctrine. It's factually necessary. In fact, if you have taken an oath as a military member of this country or an elected official, you do not have an obligation not to understand the threat doctrine of Islam. You are mandated by federal law, by federal law to factually understand the threat doctrine of Islam. And when you excise out of the intelligence and military lexicon in 2009, the words jihad, the words Muslim, the words Sharia, and you hand tie and handcuff some of the best warriors on the face of the earth, top tier team, SEAL Team 6, Aaron and, and Brian Bill, great engraved over there, and, and Benghazi, Benghazi. When you handcuff by ridiculous rules of engagement, if you're trained to be a warrior to defend and kill the to defend Americans and kill the enemy and you go and do State Department functions of winning the hearts and minds, the enemy laughs and, 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 and wonders where the, where, the, where the lethality is in America anymore. America has lost its lethality as a doctrine of warfare. Though the warriors choose to implement the doctrine of lethality engaged in combat. And for you folks involved in activism here in the States, there's a, a lethal doctrine of ideological warfare to defeat the Sharia compliant Islamic doctrine in the schools, in the churches, in the, uh, in the uh, elected arenas. A lot to do. But Federal officials, from the president down, are not allowed to not factually understand the doctrine of Islamic Jihad. Once you understand it, you'll be in a better position to defeat it, which we're not. A couple of points I'd like to leave with you. I am getting weary, very weary, of hearing the president and others say that America is war weary. War weary. I don't know what war weary means, but I do know this. When the enemy has a doctrine of eternal warfare against you and has targeted you, you don't have the luxury of being war weary, particularly if you are the commander in chief. Those words should never come out of the commander of chief's mouth. War weary can be reversed very quickly. Let the boys go, the SEAL teams. Let the Rangers go. Let the Marines for Force Recon go. Let these guys do what we've trained them to do in theater and the dynamics of this kinetic battle worldwide, because guess what? As much as the Commander-in-Chief hoped Al-Qaeda was gone, Al-Qaeda's not going anywhere. It has to be defeated, killed, continually, and there's ways of doing that. All right, couple of, just one last point here. Over here in the United States uh, and in the West, but primarily here, particularly in this state, we have been infiltrated by an organization called the Muslim Brotherhood. 
Muslim Brotherhood is a for real organization. They're card carrying people and they have a doctrine. It's been printed, they live it, they breathe it, and, um, and uh, right now there's at least six card carrying members of the Muslim Brotherhood. And when we were saying this two years ago, Trent, though, you're crazy, you're a conspiratorialist, but now as the Brotherhood has fallen apart in, in some places in the Middle East, it's advancing here. There's six card carrying members of the Brotherhood in the White House influencing this commander in chief in terms of his foreign policy and military doctrine. That's why you're seeing the kerfuffle and the nonsense going on in Syria right now. Syria should be a, um, a uh, we should sell tickets to Syria and show how Islam qua Islam, Sunni versus Shia, kill each other as they have for 1400 years. The West should look at that and say this is what Islam is what, what right do any of these people have coming into the United States and telling us how to run our country? <laughs> Muslim Brotherhood has infiltrated America. I have with me a few of the books that uh, myself and some others put together, Sharia, The Threat to America. At the end, we can, uh, we're going to sell those. But I have 50 copies of Obsession, Radical Islam's War Against the West. You can have these for free. These two books will give you a phenomenal intellectual and analytical understanding of the Islamic Jihad war we are in. Ladies and gentlemen, for the sake of those flags, of that granite, uh, I pray, I pray that there's more individuals that step up like Gene Sweeney. Let's give him a rousing round of applause. And, and where is Honey? Is Honey anywhere? Where is Honey? Honey is the honey part of Gene. Behind every great man, there's a greater woman. So. He'll be back. Don't go away. He'll be back. Um, also with these books, uh, I'll be providing a free Funk and Wagnall dictionary so you can understand some of the words that Tom uh, shared with you. Um, he's a lot. If political correctness bothers you, you have to look inside. Um, it's what it's about. We can't candy coat it. We're here. Um, and it is what it is. Also about an oath that Tom referred to, um, there is no expiration date on an oath. Representing an organization that helped us with those names, of those 81 names that are on that wall too, are recipients of the Medal of Honor. And with that, I'd like to introduce a Navy SEAL himself, retired Navy Captain Norman Olson. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here representing the Navy SEAL Foundation and the Naval Special Warfare community that it serves. Uh, before I get into my prepared remarks, three things popped into my head while I was listening. Of course, Tom Trento is my kind of a guy. And uh, last night we had dinner. And in the course of dinner, he asked me if I knew a certain, uh, he said it, he had a cousin that was a SEAL. So when I asked him who it was, he named him, and I said, my God. I said, he and I went through training together in 1955 in class 15. Now the classes today are up in the 300, so you can sort of put that in perspective. But uh, it's a small world. The other, uh, well there was two other things. The other thing was when they mentioned the USS New York, that was christened in the name of one of the seals that has been posthumously awarded the uh, Medal of Honor, uh, Lieutenant Murphy. And lastly, not really lastly, but you'll be hearing from him, is a gentleman that I established a very close relationship with after Extortion 17. Uh, Greg Bill is the father of one of those men. And we work very closely with the commands when these things happen. And over the years, the last few years, I've been on a number of events where we've shared the podium. 
a great guy. Uh, one thing I want to mention, which is inter I find interesting, even for me, there were 17 SEALs killed, and there were, some, there were Army people, uh, the pilots, and there were some uh, Air Force folks. But in addition to that, there were five what we call basically technical support people to go in the field with the SEALs. Dog handler, two explosive ordnance disposal men, a, a special communicator, and this puts, you, puts it really in context about how the technology is going today, a cryptologist. And these guys go in the field with them uh, continually. That same evening, when they were lost, there were about 10 more operations identical to it going on at the same time. Gives you a little sense of uh, how heavily engaged they are. 12 years ago, we were attacked by a nameless foe, soon to be known as Al-Qaeda. In the immediate aftermath, SEALs had boots on the ground in Afghanistan, initially conducting special reconnaissance missions in support of the Marines. Subsequently, SEAL operations during the invasion of Afghanistan were conducted with Task Force KBAR. It was a joint special operations task force comprised of Navy SEALs, Army Special Forces, Air Force Special Tact Tactics Teams, and Special Operations Forces from Norway, Germany, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and Denmark, all under the command of a Navy SEAL captain. Over the course of six months, they killed or captured over 200 Taliban and Al-Qaeda fighters and destroyed tens of thousands of pounds of weapons and ordnance. For 12 years, SEAL warriors have taken and continue to take the fight to the enemy in some of the most austere places in the planet. And one year ago, four patriots, including two former SEALs, were killed on one of those austere places called Benghazi. 81 of those SEALs have made the ultimate sacrifice and are honored on this hallowed memorial for their service to our nation. Additionally, there are untold numbers carrying the scars of operating continuously at the tip of the spear. While the loss of 81 SEALs could be seen by many as minuscule in the grand scheme of things, but when measured against a force of less than 2,400 SEALs, it's akin to the U.S. Navy losing an aircraft carrier while sailing in harm's way. Additionally, the required training cycle to fully qualify a SEAL is two years, and with an attrition rate of 75%, they cannot be mass produced and they cannot be created after emergencies occur. Under all circumstances, SEAL operators must be able to face the foe with total focus on the mission. In their case, they can do this knowing that there is an organization committed to supporting them and their families while they are in harm's way. This provides them peace of mind that is as valuable as any other weapon in their arsenal. The aforementioned organization is the Navy SEAL Foundation, our community's recognized and respected go-to organization that provides immediate and ongoing support and assistance to active duty, deceased, and wounded warriors and their families. The foundation is currently supporting 8,900 Naval Special Warfare personnel and their families, 88 fallen warriors, 57 surviving spouses, and 75 surviving children. The Naval Special Warfare Foundation has an 11-person board of directors, many of whom are Navy SEALs. The paid staff of four, they have a paid staff of four full-time and two part-time employees. We have a four-star rating from Charity Navigator, America's premier charity evaluator, and our foundation is ranked number two on their list of 10 charities worth watching. We are our best in America's chari charity as certified by Independent Charities of America. The most Im important thing for every dollar donated, 95% goes directly toward the conduct of our mission. 77% goes to family services and command support. 22% goes to educational programs. And 1% goes to legacy preservation, like this, like this memorial. 
Our, na our nation relies heavily on the strength, resiliency, and steadfastness of the Naval Special Warfare community. Never has so much been asked of so few, from so many, for so long. In this struggling economy, with government programs being cut, never before has the need for benevolent support uh, been relied on so heavily. On behalf of the Navy SEAL Foundation and the SEAL family that is Naval Special Warfare, I thank you for the opportunity to pay tribute to the fallen that have willingly given their lives during Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom, as well as some of the lesser visible operations conducted in the Horn of Africa, North Africa, the Philippines, and Central and South America. God bless our military and our retirees and, and veterans, and also, I'm a bit biased, the small band of brothers, our nation's silent professionals. Thank you very much. Before you leave, everyone, be sure to say hello to Captain Olson. He talked about the SEAL Foundation, but when he retired 30 years ago or so, he had 2,000 jumps. 2,000 jumps as a SEAL. That, that's pretty good. Give him a hand for 2,000 jumps. <laughs> then, then, a few years ago, in his early 70s, he said, I'm going back up. And about a year or two ago, on his 80th birthday, he made his 4,000th jump from an airplane. <laughs> so you can do it, our seniors out there. He's a, he's a bit of military history. Be sure to say hello to him. You know, we have to look forward and uh, to the young people around here um, and a great thanks to, uh, to these young Marines from uh, Venice Middle School, the uh, young Marines who are assisting us with programs and passing out water and helping with chairs and all of that. And we have a great future in those young individuals. I am so very proud to have with us here for the fourth year from the beginning when we started with the idea in meetings up at Lakewood Ranch as to where the memorial was ultimately going to go. Started with her sister Gabrielle and then as Gabrielle went on to college her sister Ava who is with us today who is so incredibly special and a great a great contribution to the youth as a role model um, and as a fine young person. Ava is 16 years old and I didn't even mention her years last year because it's incredibly overwhelming. She is a senior at Venice High School. She's the past president of the Young Conservatives of Sarasota which has provided the 9-11 Never Forget Flag Memorial that you see planted out there, which they planted yesterday over 3,000 flags, which they have done for the last four years. This year, the flag... <laughs> this year, the flag memorial was set up with the help of the sixth grade class of Venice Christian School and Iron Patriots. Aver's new organization towards supporting the veterans and activity uh, which she is a part of is the Iron Patriots. Currently, Ava serves her community through her involvement with the Venice High School Zoology Club, Zoology Club, the Key Club, and Chamber Orchestra. This is the fifth year Ava has played the violin as a member of the Sarasota Youth Orchestra. Ava is a founding member of the Strings Attached, a student lead string <coughs> court, <coughs> excuse me, and is a member of the National Honor Society. Outside of school, Ava is, a passionate, is passionate about horses. She is an avid rider and will begin competing uh, this year. Um, Ava also uh, hopes to one day attend the University College of Veterinary Medicine. I am so pleased and so proud to have a young friend, Ava Dorosame, 
whose parents are <clears throat> immigrants of their grandparents who are from India, who her grandfather was a Hindu, converted to Christianity, served as a missionary in Africa, where her father was born, who's here today, Raj, and the girls and their family are an incredible indication of what we have in the hope, uh, which is a reality moving forward to our future. Ava Dorosami. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sweeney, for inviting me to speak today. Uh, good morning, everyone. It is truly an honor to be here. My name is, as you heard, Eva Dorosami. I am 16 years old and currently attending Venice High School. I was 11 years old when my family and a group of students and their families first assembled the 9-11 Never Forget Flag Memorial you see over there today. This year, I want to thank my former principal, Jerry Frimmel, and the sixth grade students of Venice Christian School who enthusiastically accepted my organization's invitation to come and help assemble this year's flag memorial for all of us today. I was a first grader at Venice Christian School when the Twin Towers were attacked in 2001. Back then, I did not fully understand the impact of the event. However, as I grew older, my parents carefully explained the actual events of that terrible day. It was then that I realized for the first time that there are people who dream of the destruction of our country. Now, in high school, I have conversations with my grandfather about our wonderful country and why it is that our freedoms are like no other country on the history of this earth. We talk about other constitutions people live by, that is, if they have constitutions at all. It is, the only, it is only the American Constitution that acknowledges the individual as having natural, God-given rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of the individual's happiness, and therefore cannot be taken away by government. No other Constitution <laughs> elevates and protects the rights of the individual in this way. All other constitutions give degrees of the rights to its people as the government sees fit. And therefore, since government gives, it can and will take away. I have learned that since the beginning of time, people who crave power have always tried to make others a part of a collective that they themselves would control. This is and was, it, this was and is the goal of terrorists who seek to attack us. If they had a chance to weaken us and perhaps destroy us, they would want to one day rule over us. My grandfather, in his own study of history, literature, and philosophy, has shown me that this very concept of natural law is at the heart of everything in our history and what has made America that shining light on a hill. This God-given freedom of the individual protected by the Constitution is why America is exceptional. This is the reason This is the reason why we have such a great sense of love and desire to gather here today and remember the 2977 people who went to work or traveled as free people that day in 2001 but who never returned to their homes and loved ones. It is why we take great effort to remember the events of 9/11 and why we take great effort in asking others to also remember it is why we have a deep, deep love for our country and for the military servicemen and women who give the ultimate sacrifice to keep our country free. It is why we are here today sharing in tears with moms and dads who lost, lost their sons and daughters. It is why we honor our veterans. You see, it means something. It means something and we remember. God bless you and God bless America. My son Darren lost his life on December 30th, 2009, in Fort Chapman, Afghanistan. Darren was one of seven CIA officers killed that day in one of the most tra tragic events in CIA history. In December 2009, 
A group of CIA's top terrorist hunters gathered in secret base in Afghanistan to re greet a rising superstar, Human Khalil Abalawi, a Jordanian who had infiltrated the upper ranks of Al-Qaeda. For months he had sent shocking revelations from inside the terrorist network and now promised to help the CIA assassinate Osama bin Laden's top deputy and provide critical information on the whereabouts of bin Laden. Instead, as he stepped from his car, <clears throat> Al Balawi detonated a 30 pound bomb. instantly killing Darren and six other CIA operatives and giving the agency its worst loss of life in decades. As I pondered what to write that would capture the essence of Darren, I would start by saying he was the most loving and caring human being that I'd ever known. He would certainly be remembered for his adventures, travel, intrigue, and valor. However, Darren cared more about his fellow man than most. His compassion for all people, regardless of religion, creed, or color, was the attributes that I most admired, even though I did not share the same warmth for mankind. He saw the greater good in everyone. As a little boy, Darren achieved results that were astounding. Everyone loved him. Teachers, peers, competitors, family all marveled about his wonderful human being so full of life, yet so focused on the tasks in hand. Darren played organized sports from a very early age, so young that we always had to sign waivers. He was just outstanding. I remember that he was one that always seemed to get that clutch hit to win the baseball game or to run for a touchdown to win the football game. His focus and will was amazing. Yet he did not allow himself to be stereotypical. In his senior year of high school, he chose not to play any sports and de dedicated himself to playing in the high school band, which, by the way, killed me. Many college scouts were looking at Darren to play ball at their institution. In fact, two major league baseball teams offered Darren a minor league contract, which he turned down. He didn't envision himself leading that type of life. His passion for excellence was also embodied in the fact that he studied the martial arts from the time he can walk and achieved a fourth degree black belt. He not only enjoyed the physical aspect of controlling one's body, but he, developed, he delved deeply into the spiritual aspect of meditation and mind control. He was truly a model student of the arts. <laughs> to my dismay, while I was in a job transfer status, Darren joined the Army, not only Army, but the Rangers. I swallowed hard as I served during Vietnam and did not want that for my son. But I supported him and assumed that this may be the time that this adventure just might be too tough even for Darren, but I was wrong. Not only did he accomplish becoming a Ranger, the accounts by his superiors and peers were that Darren was the poster boy for the Rangers. He influenced all around him, officers and enlisted alike, in fact, he turned down a commission because the Army would not promise him that he would return to the Ranger Battalion. Camille and I endured the four years of his service watching CNN and praying for his safety as Bosnia was in turmoil and the Middle East was heating up. Our prayers were answered as he was discharged and soon married Rachel. Darren's calling was law enforcement. In fact, his master's degree in public administration and criminal justice. He started a string of unbelievable accomplishments over the next few years that were truly incredible. As he was serving as a police officer in Libertyville, Illinois, the events of 9-11 occurred. That would change his and our lives forever. Darren was so distraught over the loss of life by terrorists, he vowed to make a difference, and make a difference he did. Darren joined the U.S. Marshals, which he received the Director's Award for Leadership at their Fletzy Training Center. He went on to become a team leader in their highly regarded Rapid Response Unit in Chicago. That wasn't enough. He was putting bad guys away all right, but not the terrorists that struck our country. He then joined the FBI, where he received two awards at Quantico, which, by the way, had never been done before, the Director's Award for Leadership and Top Gun. He was then assigned to the New York branch of the FBI where he worked in concert there with Washington on counterterrorism. While he was doing a lot of work there, he still was not making the progress that he wanted as Al-Qaeda was still making inroads 
and Americans were dying. Darren joined the CIA and because of his experience, he quickly assumed a hybrid role. He was a case officer and an SAD officer. He continued on to serve in Iraq and then Af Afghanistan, constantly closing in on the enemy. The CIA considered Darren the tip of the spear as he was one of our top agents in tracking down and destroying Al-Qaeda operatives. He had multiple successes in Iraq and Afghanistan over a four year period, but now he and his wife Rachel had just given birth to my granddaughter Raina and it was time for him to leave the battlefield. He accepted an assignment in Jordan and was responsible for counterterrorism, and we all thought that he'd be behind the scenes, not the epicenter anymore. Unfortunately, we were wrong. Darren's passion to prevent another 9-11 tragedy brought him closer and closer to the enemy, and consequently, he lost his life. Darren's valor is most epitomized in this excerpt from a eulogy given by the station commander in Jalalabad. At another place and in another time, Darren would have been the first to stand with Leonidas at Thermopylae Pass against thousand to one odds, knowing that we, they would not be victorious, but willing to sacrifice themselves only to buy a little time for the Greek army to rally elsewhere. Darren would have been the one to shout, Molin Lobby, come and get them to the Persian army demanding that they lay down their weapons and surrender. And Darren would have been totally content with this situation, simply knowing that he was serving in the finest of company because that's all he ever asked for in return for his faithful and fearless service to his nation. His loss leaves a significant gap in the lines and a real void in all of us who serve with him. But my hope is that we can keep him with us by remembering what he meant to each of us. So I will not say farewell. I will only say, no worries, brother. We'll carry on the colors onward from here. Mullen Lobby, see you on the other side, Spartan. I consider myself I consider myself the most fortunate father in the world. I was Darren's dad for 35 years. And the character and the folks, which are all of you and those of you who have joined us today, because this memorial was built and constructed by individuals who made contributions without a single cent of taxpayer dollars and was also assisted by a local organization here called the Navy, excuse me, the uh, Venice uh, Gulf Coast Community Foundation, Gulf Coast Gives, who without their support and assistance and belief in what we were doing could not have happened. So with that, I'd like to introduce Mayor John Hollett. Thank you, Gene. And uh, before I say any other words, I'd just like to recognize the other council members in the audience today. Uh, Jeanette Gates I see out there, Jim Bennett, uh, David Sherman, and I know Emilio Carlesimo is up here. I, I don't know if anyone else is here. Um, but uh, thank you all for coming. And I'd uh, like to say that it's truly an honor and a privilege to represent the city at a memorial event such as this. And it's extremely humbling to be here in the presence of so many veterans, those that have assured our freedom, and so many of our first responders, those who would give their life without hesitation to save ours. Do you remember where you were on September 11th, 2001? Yes, sir. Were you shopping? Were you having breakfast? Talking on the phone? I remember exactly where I was that day. I was at work, pre-market, before the opening of the New York Stock Exchange, and had the TV on, and within seconds of 8.46 in the morning, knew that a plane had hit the North Tower. I knew at that time it wasn't an accident. I was a former air traffic controller, and I can tell you that an accident like that does not happen 
without air traffic control knowing it's an accident. Air traffic control was lost that day. They had no idea that plane was going to hit the tower. They had no idea the plane was even there. They totally lost radar contact with it. I will never, ever forget where I was that day. I'll never forget what happened that day. I remember where I was. I remember what happened. We must never forget. We must always remember what they did and what it meant to us. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Hollick. Um, community comes together and uh, again, reflections uh, of where people were and their immediate involvement. And uh, there's a gentleman here who literally had his hand on the pulse um, as it happened. And uh, he is here with us today. He was a lead detective at that time, and he is now your chief of police. And I'd like to introduce, uh, who is now, uh, and I'm very proud uh, to call a friend, is uh, your chief of police, Tom McNulty. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. On behalf of the Venice Police Department, I want to thank both our citizens and our visitors for being here today. On this date 12 years ago, the, on this date 12 years ago, the cowardly acts of terrorists changed our nations as well as our lives. When the terrorists struck Shanksville, Pennsylvania, the Twin Towers, as well as our Pentagon. Husbands, wives, children, grandparents, assorted family members became victims of these cowardly acts and in the wake family lives and family histories are forever changed. We as a nation also changed that day as we watched in horror as the Twin Towers fell to the ground. Many of us fell to our knees praying for those that perished. Our innocence as a nation, our way of life changed and we were attacked on our own soil. But if I, as I have said at past memorial services and I was involved in the investigation to other terrorists, their mission failed. And let me repeat this again because it's important. Their mission failed. Yes, we were temporarily crippled, but we did what we do best as Americans. We stood together, we faced the fight, and as a group we said, never again. The attempts by these cowards to cripple us with chaos had the reverse effect. They didn't weaken us. They made us stronger. On that day, all race and creeds stood together, welded together as a united force known as Americans. As we stand here 12 years later, let this be a lesson to those who threaten us that we will never forget. Let this be a reminder that our weaknesses will always become our strengths. And in closing, I want to take this opportunity to thank our, fa our military, their families, as well as our federal, local, and state law enforcement who continue to protect us from these cowardly acts. Folks, we wake up in the morning and most of us worry about what we're going to do that morning. There's a whole legion of dedicated professionals that wake up and guarantee that we will have a morning. Thank you, God bless all of you, and I'm proud to be here with all of you. It doesn't get any closer to the reality of, of actually what happened 12 years ago this morning. Uh, again, um, reflections. Um, appropriately enough, um, our, uh, our congressman could not be here, uh, Vern Buchanan, uh, but it would not be an event without his office being represented by um, one of our dear colleagues and Danny who has participated in every event from the beginning uh, to the first presentation when the first rendering was presented to uh, Congressman uh, Buchanan. Um, I'd like to take this time to have uh, Danny uh, say something. Uh, he speaks from himself but also on behalf 
of, uh, of Congressman Vern Buchanan. As I have stood here many times before, it is always a privilege and a pleasure to stand before a group such as this on a special day for remembrance and reflection on behalf of Congressman Buchanan. And even though he cannot be here today, he sends these words to each and every one of you. On September 11, 2001, we experienced the worst terrorist attack in our nation's history. America's response was swift, unified, and inspiring. We will always remember those innocent men, women, and children who lost their lives in the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and Shanksville, Pennsylvania. We will never forget the heroic actions of the passengers aboard Flight 93 and the fearless emergency responders who rushed towards the wreckage and devastation at Twin Towers and whose inspiring actions helped save the lives of others. On this anniversary, let us also reflect on the selfless service of our armed services and forces and our intelligent officials who have kept our homeland safe from further attacks on our soil. Despite the death of Osama bin Laden and the capture of many members in this terrorist network, we must never let our guard down. Just one year ago today, four great Americans lost their lives during an attack on our U.S. consulate in Benghazi, Libya. The chief responsibility of our government should be to keep the nation and its people safe, both home and abroad. One of the worst days in our nation's history has brought out the best of the American spirit, evidenced by you all here being here today. And I just want to do a little shout out to the salt of the earth, Gene and Tim, for getting this charge going quite a few years ago to make this a special place and a special day where we can remember and reflect on what has happened. And it has brought our, yes, go ahead. He never likes it when I do that, but I, I think it's important. And to all the rest, you know, he, they've all been mentioned who has helped make this day a reality. And it will, us all coming together, bring our great nation back to its glory and its feet. Twelve years later, September 11th is a day of reverence, remembrance, and reflection. A reminder that America will never crumble in times of distress or difficulty. God bless you and God bless America. At this point I'd like for you to meet Scott Bill, the father of Brian Bill, Navy SEAL Team 6 member who was killed on Exertion 17, August 6, 2011. Well, thank you. Hi, everybody. I bet your asses are falling asleep out there, right? Or well, your legs are getting awful tired. Anyway, I'll be short. Uh, I've changed my speech about four times because uh, people here have said a lot of great things that uh, I wanted to say to you also. Um, but anyway, I've got one consolation for Darren's dad. Uh, my son's team is the team that took out Bin Laden and put him in the sea forever. <laughs> anyway, uh, a brief history. My son was in the middle of five kids. Grew up kind of bumping into things all the time and kind of strange. I can remember him when he was probably eight years old. He used to climb out the window on the second floor and jump off the roof. I'm like, what the hell? You know, he thought he was Superman, but he didn't have a cape. Well, 20-some years later, I found out he had some special skills that very few men have. And uh, he became a Navy SEAL. And after accomplishing that, he got invited to join a very select secretive group called DevGru. And thanks to Joe Biden, called SEAL Team 6. Nobody was ever really supposed to know about that, but uh, now it's SEAL Team 6, not helping our enemies any. But uh, he was able to get on, was selected and able to make that team, uh, which is our elite team, uh, probably the most elite fighters in the world today. And uh, they've taken out 
tens of thousands of people that we don't even know about. And uh, like Norm Olson said, Captain Olson, 10 missions going on that night. They work 24 seven around the world. We never know where they are, what they're doing, but they're doing it for those red, white, and blue stripes up there for us. And they're patriots. Anyway, I know our boys are looking down at us today, right here in this park. And I know my son wants me to say that uh, he was not in it for himself, he was in it for us. He was a patriot. He believed in our country, believed in God. He believed in the freedoms that this country gave us. And they don't come without sacrifices. They don't come without hard work. And I think everybody sitting here damn well knows to be an American takes a work. It's a privilege. It's a damn good privilege that not many people in this world have. But we're here, we're honoring our fallen today because we respect that they were Americans and we respect being American. So God bless all of you. One other thing, take a walk over to that monument and just focus on one name for me, any name on there. And think about them, think about their family and say a prayer. God bless all of you. Well, come to a mic change. Uh, yeah, right. Um, every minute of this has been a special sort of an event, and now we're come to uh, to the beginning of uh, a recognition, and we'd like to do this. So, don't get scared. We are going to ring the bell, but we're not going to ring it three thousand times. <laughs> so, uh, what I'd like to do in what has become a tradition here both at groundbreaking and also at the dedication last year and then also here today is we're going to do a commemorative if you will we're going to do the ringing of the bell by certain categories and uh, as i as i announce these categories i'm going to ask uh captain <clears throat> james orman to uh to ring the bell the total number of individuals attacked uh, the official figure as of September 5th 2002 was 2,819 for a total number of 246 passengers and including 180 at the Pentagon for a total of 3,245. The total number of NYPD was 23. Total number of first responders, FDNY, 343 firefighters. 37 New York, New Jersey, Port Authority Police, 37. <clears throat> there were 60 various different companies involved, 60 individuals, and the total number of employees in that regard one company alone, Cantor Fitzgerald, lost 658. And as of a few days ago, the current count of our fallen military heroes, servicemen and women who have been killed in Iraqi freedom since 12 years ago today, and subsequently the additional four in Benghazi and the additional <clears throat> number killed on August 6th. <clears throat> in that regard, we now have 6,727 American fallen heroes. 